Uh, I love that about Unity, that we work the music right in, because the music, the music is the vibration of God. It's the emotion and the feeling, and I love that. Um, and I was just thinking as I looked at this, this reminds me of Wonder Woman's plane. And it's like the, the invisible podium. And I think that's an appropriate uh, reference for today. So I wanted to begin today in a little bit of an unusual way. I want to begin with a riddle. So just play along. Now, if you know the answer, do your best to not just shout it out. I want everybody to be able to think about this. So here it is. A father and son are in a car crash. The father is immediately killed. The son is rushed to the hospital, where the surgeon enters and says, I can't operate on this boy, he's my son. What happened? Now, I've given this riddle to quite a number of people over the years. The answers I've heard involve time travel, parallel universes, cloning, and all kinds of wild alternate realities. I've told this story over and over and had people stumped. So I'll give it to you one more time. A father and son are in a car crash. The father is immediately killed. The son is rushed to the hospital where the surgeon enters and says, I can't operate on this boy. He's my son. What happened? Well, here is the elegant and apparently almost invisible solution. Anyone want to guess? His it's his mother. <laughs> Now, <laughs> I posed this riddle back in uh, 2008 to two very strong feminists, both around 30, who spent about a half an hour with me guessing and never came up with that. A young waitress came over and was equally stumped. I even told them, you're going to feel really bad when you hear the answer. <laughs> But really, there's no point in feeling bad. It's just the effect of cumulative thought over centuries of what we can call sexism to limit our imaginations. And I'm pleased that a few people here knew it so easily, and maybe that's progress. <laughs> this is larger than just men and women. It gets at our entire way of conceiving reality, as large as the erroneous belief that the world is flat or at the center of the universe or that heaven and hell are real places that God sends us. Rianne Eisler speaks of domination societies versus those of partnership. Domination societies, like our own, base reality on a male-centric ethos of winners and losers. Partnership societies, like many Native American cultures, are in tune with the feminine and concepts associated with femininity, like cooperation, compassion, collaboration, intuition, spirituality over religion, spectrums over binaries, curiosity over judgment, etc. And of course, no society is entirely one or the other. So she speaks of a spectrum between domination and partnership and points to our modern Western civilization as pretty close to the far end of the domination side of that. And this is not just sort of out there in the world, outside of us, because we live within this paradigm of self-shame, competition, the desire to defeat rather than cooperate with our enemies, especially right now in modern politics. It can be very hard to see it in ourselves precisely because we're so steeped in it. The domination paradigm cuts across religions, right and left, permeates our movies and mythology, informs our notions of success and personal worth, and can even blind us to our own inherent and complicated beauty. Now this talk is called Women, Love, and Power. I wanted to explore these three things as they relate to each other because too often we associate power with masculinity, victory, and force. At Unity of New York, back when we met live, we used to sing the prayer for protection. And the children would get up front and lead us. They learned gestures to go along with each line. And the audience would join in. So, the light of God surrounds us. The love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. 
and I'm going to stop there. <laughs> so what do we notice there? Somehow, even in unity, on a Sunday, we were associating power with muscle and a shield and teaching that to our kids. Now, in fact, look at the stories kids grow up with, especially those given to boys, and it's no wonder that this thought system runs deep. And of course, my point here is not to single out or pick on anyone. The point is that even we can be deeply affected by this paradigm. And the fact we can point this out and look at it is actually a sign of great hope. And that's true of all of our spiritual growth. When we spot something we're working on and we keep seeing it, that is progress. Now, I've had this mindset myself. It was only recently I realized that what really sold me on my first boyfriend 25 years ago was the fact that no one could tell he was gay, which is really code for he was not effeminate. I had to hide that. Now, as I matured and my life grew richer, my choices expanded greatly. I wear different, more colorful clothing, express a fuller spectrum of emotion than the almost monotone one I entered therapy with many years ago, when my voice did not go up like that. It stayed here all the time. Now, I'm in a process of embracing the femininity within me to find the balance of energies. It's not about denying masculine, rather it's about integrating the feminine aspects or those aspects we have been taught to associate with the feminine and have been taught are therefore inferior. In Nurturing Our Humanity, Ms. Eisler asks, why have abuse and violence against women and girls not been on the agenda as egregious human rights violations long before now? A major reason for the silence is that we've been taught through history, philosophy, social practice, politics, religion, and other cultural institutions that the female part of humanity is not important. After all, history is the story of man his story, if you will, about those who dominated and killed or did important things in the world. It's about individual winners, and never that I can recall about mothers, teachers, nurses, mentors, people who are in the background and treated as background actors in the film of civilization. They're extras. And if you think about it, even compensated the way an extra would be as opposed to the star of the movie. <laughs> there will not be an award tonight for best extra. Maybe there should be. Meaning in life is often posited as something associated with fame or fortune or accomplishment or something we can measure, an income level, the size of a house. When you meet someone, they will often ask, what do you do? As opposed to, tell me about a movie or story you love. They seem to be saying, tell me something impressive I can quickly understand and categorize, rather than open me up to the mystery of you. Because we've been in this mindset for so long, alternatives like compassion and cooperation can sound tepid, something for Sesame Street, but not for adults. I think we've grown weak in our ability to imagine other ways, uncurious or dismissive of alternatives. We have hallmark versions of forgiveness and love, giving lip service to ideas like peace. People even make fun of kumbaya moments. And that song is so beautiful and meaningful. But the solution is staring us in the face, especially on Sundays. It's just that, as the late Bishop John Shelby Spong so memorably put it, the problem with the Christian faith in our day is not that it's failed. The problem is it's never really been tried. Here is Rianne Eisler from her classic book, The Chalice and the Blade. When we look closely, not only at what Jesus taught, but at how he went about disseminating his message, time and again, we find he was preaching was the gospel of a partnership society. He rejected the dogma that high-ranking men, in Jesus' day priests, nobles, rich men, and kings, are the favorites of God. He mingled freely with women, thus openly rejecting the male supremacist norms of his time, and in sharp contrast to the views of later Christian sages who actually debated whether women had a soul, Jesus did not preach the ultimate dominator message that women are spiritually inferior to men. She's quite a writer. 
Jesus had a radical take on power that was not just ahead of his time, I think it's ahead of our time. In Divine Audacity, Unity Minister Linda Martella Witset says, as is true for all our abilities, power can be used to improve or control our material life, and it can be cultivated as spiritual power for inner transformation as well as for blessing others. 100 years ago, Charles Fillmore captured the trouble so many have in succeeding. Today, men are striving to acquire power through money, legislation, and man-made government, and falling short because they have not mastered themselves. She goes on to say, Jesus' spiritual authority came not from his personality and not from his intellect. His authority came from the Father, his source of inner wisdom. We too must partner power with wisdom in order to be centered in spiritual life. And I like that, partnering our wisdom with our power. Because that is, I think, real power. It's deep. The kind we boldly proclaim in our very first unity principle. There is only one enduring power in the universe and in our lives, God the good. Now, we codified the unity principles back in the 90s. But the ideas, of course, go way back. One of my favorite spiritual authors is a German nun who passed away back in the 70s. She once said, God is the good and all things which proceed from God are good. Sounds familiar. She also said, all living creatures are sparks from the radiation of God's brilliance, emerging from God like the rays of the sun, which I think is beautiful. Now, I'm a little tricky. I mentioned that this nun predates the Unity Principles by a bit since she passed away back in the 70s. What I neglected to mention is she passed away in the 1170s, <laughs> or 1179 to be precise. And her name was Hildegard of Bingen. And this is a woman who embodied and expressed the fullness of power in her life. Hildegard of Bingen lived from 1098 to 1179. She transcended the confines of her time, rising to a position of influence unheard of in medieval Europe, especially for women, and continuing to garner respect almost a thousand years later, having been named a saint in 2012. In her lifetime, get this, she wrote three volumes of visionary theology, over 400 letters, including to popes and emperors, two books on natural medicine and cures, at least 69 musical compositions. She went on four preaching tours throughout Germany, founded and led two monasteries, and created her own language, lingua ignata. She's also known for her stunning artwork. Her tenacity conversing with popes, going over the head of an abbot to get an archbishop to approve her plan, seems to stem from the certainty that she was led by God. Her powerful visions began at age three, but she didn't write them down for public review until age 41. And they soon garnered the attention and approval of Pope Eugenius. This gave her instant authority in a world dominated by men. She knew how to work within the power structures of her time without getting lost in them. Be in the world, but not of it. Her visions, which she experienced while fully awake with eyes open, touched upon that spiritual power that really all the great masters point to throughout the ages. The voice of the living light, as she put it, spoke to Hildegard of the mystery that animates creation. Quote, I am the breeze that nurtures all things green. I encourage blossoms to flourish with ripening fruits. I adorn all the earth. I am the rain coming from the dew that causes the grass to laugh with the joy of life. She also said, humanity, take a good look at yourself. Inside, you've got heaven and earth and all of creation. You're a world. Everything is hidden in you. Back in the 11th century. Now, this is the power that Jesus and so many others urge us to tap into. And it's not always easy, but it is the fullness of life that I think he promised when he said he came that we might have life and have it abundantly. Theologian Walter Wink points to the radical nonviolence that Jesus preached. 
In just one part of Matthew are several daring instructions that almost everyone has missed, but Wink puts them in context and reinterprets them in a way that I found startling, that finally meshes with the real teachings of Jesus. So here's the New International Version, Matthew 5, 38 to 45. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So now let's look at this as Walter Wink has pointed out. Do not resist an evil person. Well, resist in Greek really means stand against, as in militarily. Don't violently, is this on? Yeah. Okay, good. Don't violently resist someone. Don't join their battle. Now, here's the one I find most interesting. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. So he puts this in context, reminding us that back in Jesus' time, you would only hit with your right hand. The left hand was never to be used for that. If someone was inferior to you, you hit them with the back of your hand across their right cheek. Think about it, right hand, back hand. So if you turn the other cheek, you're saying to them, in effect, you may hit me, but you will do so as my equal. A four-handed slap was the way you slapped someone who was equal with you. Thus helping to awaken the conscience and consciousness of the abuser. We are equals, friend. And this reminds me of the lunch counters, the way those were integrated way back in the 60s. People sat down peacefully and said, we are peacefully integrating, your move is next, but we will stay peaceful. And that woke up the conscience of America. If anyone wants to sue you, sorry, yes, to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Well, Walter Wink, puts that in context and says that nakedness back then was shameful for the viewer. So again, waking up the consciousness, the sense of healthy shame, what have I done? I've taken everything from this person. And again, in a peaceful way, helping to, them to awaken. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Well, what's that about? It turns out that back then, in ancient Rome, the Romans were actually allowed to force Jews to carry their load for one mile and no more. The soldiers were told about this. If they went more than one mile, there'd be a punishment and they had mile markers on the road. So by continuing to walk that extra mile, you're again making him realize what he's doing. Now, all of this segues right into love your enemy. Why? Because God does that and you're God's child, so own that. Uh, none of this, as I say, is easy. It's so outside our normal way of thinking that we've missed it and dismissed it. Turn the other cheek. That might sound weak. What am I, a doormat? But if we put it in context, it becomes quite profound in unexpected ways. And of course, that's just one way of interpreting that. There are many others, beautiful metaphysical ways of interpreting that. But I find the Walter Wink interpretation particularly revealing in today's context. But the dominance paradigm had no reason to explore that part of the Bible. Better to dismiss it as one of Jesus's sort of impossible and irrelevant sayings. So it's not about rolling over and accepting injustice, but it's also not about joining the injustice, fighting fire with fire, so to speak, and thereby helping to set the world ablaze. It's about meeting it with love, Radical, redemptive love, as Martin Luther King used to say, because, as John Lewis so memorably put it, hate is too heavy a burden to bear. And so I think John Lewis reminds us that we suffer from hatred within us, not just that what comes to us, but also that 
which comes from us. And we are responsible for that one preposition, from. What is coming from me, or if you prefer, what is coming through me. I may, in point of fact, be the victim of many things that are coming at me, but my inner world is co-created by me with the help of what we call God, the energy of love itself deep inside us. And that sometimes can sound corny, and it is if we say so. But the alternative is on display right now if you turn on the news. In Divine Audacity, right after talking about the need to master ourselves, to master our inner lives and the struggles in our outer ones, Reverend, Reverend Martella Witset suggests a possible connection. I believe that everyday power struggles lead to rifts, family feuds, and wars. Everyday power struggles lead to self-degradation and deflation of self-worth, which lead to your dimming your inner light and withdrawing from being the blessing you are here on earth to be. I think we are part of a mighty ripple. And what we practice today matters because we matter. We can embody the belief that regular people are inherently wondrous and blessed by acting that way ourselves and treating others that way too. If we devalue ourselves and try to bless others, we are giving from an empty cup. If we value ourselves exclusively and ignore others, then we're living in self-imposed exile, a place of fear and doubt. But by identifying with our fullness and loving that completely, we shine out, we shine out like the light on a hill. The, in her classic book, The Dark Side of the Light Chasers, Debbie Ford invites us to explore and even befriend the shadow, the shadow within us, the dark parts of ourselves we've disowned and which thereby run our lives. And I encourage you to read that book. But we've made femininity into a collective shadow. The creation story posits that Adam came first and Eve emerged out of her. We've been taught that Eve ushered us into original sin and we are thereby cursed. But Bishop Spawn points out that the ancient Hebrews saw this as Eve ushering us into our humanity, into this realm to bring our divine inheritance here and transform the world. So let's learn and teach another way, I would say. Let's rise to Bishop Spong's challenge and really try what Jesus suggests, as we do here. Women can be surgeons, and men can be nurses. Women can get angry, and men can cry. And our anger can be steeped in compassion, and our tears can be strong. This is a paradigm shift, not a strategy we can employ to quickly solve any problem. We didn't get here quickly, so it may take time to fully inhabit a new way. As an analogy, consider our physical health. If our heart is weak and we change our diet and activity, that progress takes time. But we begin to feel healthier and we may even inspire others. We can act as ambassadors, way showers, to a reality of partnership. Every time we question our old assumptions, reach beyond our comfort zone into this new realm, we make it more visible right here and right now. So as we go through Women's History Month, let us honor women in history and women everywhere today, to honor them by seeing them, admiring them in ways we usually don't. Let's imagine a world where we no longer need a Women's History Month because all of us learn to honor the full spectrum of femininity and masculinity equally. And eventually, maybe we don't even need those labels. Imagine that reality in living color because as we do, we help co-create a new paradigm where power comes not from domination, but as Jesus taught, from cooperation and love, because that is the true power of God. Thank you.